right, ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our uh, guest speaker, Glenn Podonsky. Glenn's uh, just an amazing individual. He's got over 40 years of public service, in, starting in the Air Force and then uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, IAEA, 20 years in DOE uh, plus, and then now in Homeland Security. And I've had the pleasure and the honor of working with him for more than 20 years during his tenure at uh, DOE. And the one thing that I'd say about uh, Glenn that really sets him apart, there are many things, but in working with him at DOE, I know that he's one of those people that comes to work every day and says, let's solve problems for the country together. Now, what do you want to do? So he is now in one of the very critical positions at uh, Department of Homeland Security, and he's going to explain tonight about their mission and all the things that they do to keep us uh, safe. So Glenn, without further ado, please welcome Glenn Pananski. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really a, a privilege and an honor for me to have this opportunity to talk to you about uh, um, Homeland Security and the science and technology group that I, uh, I serve with. And as uh, John said, my name is Glenn Podonsky, and um, I want to talk to you about what it is that science and technology does for the nation through Homeland Security. I will tell you, I'm not going to talk about the border wall. I'm not going to talk about immigration. I'm here to talk about things that you don't even know, and I didn't even know at the beginning. Um, I usually like to start with something funny. Um, and since I'm here to speak about a federal agency, allow me to share what many, think, many people think about uh, the three cardinal rules of bureaucracy. Number one. Never use one word when a dozen will suffice. If it can be understood, it isn't finished yet. Never hire one person when you can hire 10 to do the job of one. As John said, I began my government career uh, about 45 years ago. Uh, it started in the Air Force, and then I was joined the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, and I was a licensing official there for non-power reactors. And then I got recruited to be a weapons inspector at the IAEA over in Vienna, Austria, and uh, that was really quite, quite, quite amazing. And then I spent 35 years at the Department of Energy uh, working for the last 11 secretaries of energy. Currently, I am with the Department of Homeland Security, and I will tell you, when I arrived, I couldn't even spell DHS. Uh, I failed at retirement. I retired about a year and a half ago. Uh, Homeland Security asked me if I would come help them stand up their, safe, their uh, science and technology directorate because they were reorganizing as government uh, agencies always do. And uh, I talked to my wife, and she didn't want twice the husband for half the pay, so I went back to the government. So I'm here to talk to you about the uh, research and development arm of Homeland Security, as I said. Uh, and although I've only been there for eight months, um, I can tell you it's an amazing department and it could not be as effective as it wasn't for science and technology. Now, to begin with, let me start out. You all know about large malls, like the Mall of America. Mall of America is four and a half miles, 520 stores, okay, and about 200 entrances and exits. So when you go to a mall, what do you look for? You look for the directory. And the most important thing at the directory is the red arrow. <laughs> it is, you are here. You have to know where you're at before you can get to go where you want to get as your endpoint. This is the only bureaucratic chart I will have tonight. <laughs> the red box is Science and Technology Directorate. The blue box is at the bottom, which you cannot read, which is a typical government slide, are all the operational components of Homeland Security. And since you can't read them, I'll read them for you. So you have Customs and Border Protection, 
You have infrastructure security agency that was just formed recently. You have the Citizens Immigration Services. You have FEMA. Everybody knows about FEMA. U.S. Coast Guard. You have Customs and Enforcement, Secret Service, and Transportation Security Administration. And those are the operational elements. All the other elements are those that are supporting those blue boxes. So I would like to ask Alex to show a short video that just kind of illustrates all the things that we do at DHS. So my talk tonight about science and technology is focused on the intersection of science and security. DHS is mostly a law enforcement agency with mostly a law enforcement mission to protect the nation. So how did we get to the intersection of science and security? Following September 11th, the attacks on the United States, the President created the Department of Homeland Security and it would change the way we think about security in the country. We now do it in a much more integrated fashion. Most of us, myself included prior to going, only thought of, TS, of TSA at the airports, and we probably don't realize all the other missions that exist. And what I would like to do is talk about those just briefly. So we secure our nation's borders. We protect transit systems. We provide federal assistance to disaster survivors. We protect federal facilities. And we help protect critical infrastructure. So this is an enormous job. And like I said, many of you may not have known the breadth of DHS any more than I did before I went there. And what I've just talked about is just the security part, not all the science and technology. Where does the science come from? Well, when DHS was stood up in 2001, they decided, the Congress decided they needed a research and development arm. And that's where science and technology came, and it wasn't stood up until 2003. And what the science and technology arm did, it was bring together senior scientists and engineers from all across the country to oversee both the development and deployment of security solutions nationwide. Can you read these components on this slide? So those are all the operational components. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and just give you a smattering of some of the technologies we've developed for some of these agencies. We spend roughly $560 million a year developing, finding, coordinating with universities, DOE labs, DOD labs, to make sure that we are providing the first responders with the latest technology. And the first responders, by definition, is not just the law enforcement, but it's also the emergency medical folks that do the rescues in the floods, in the fires, in the earthquakes. Uh, so we, we as an agency are extremely diverse. What are the security solutions? Well, they integrate scientific advances into the frontline solution. 
Therefore, the modern day security professional, including federal law enforcement, emergency managers, or chief technology officers. These men and women consistently need better tools to get ahead of an adversary, to get ahead of a storm, to get ahead of a cyber attack. And it's the role of S&T to ensure that they are equipped with the most up-to-date technology available. Security solutions have an intended purpose. They are quite literally the intersection of science and security. So as I stated, this is why the success of DHS mission depends on the work of S&T. Let me digress just for a moment. Most of our government agencies are headed up by political appointees appointed by each administration. The political appointees serve at the pleasure of the administration. They're not there long enough across the agencies to be able to sustain a long-term solution. So if you think of DHS, we've had a number of secretaries, as in my previous career at DOE, and some of them are very good and they have great concepts that they want to bring to the agency. But unfortunately, they're not there long enough to sustain that change. And if you think of DHS just for a moment, is I, I mentioned all these components. Imagine coming into an agency with 22 operational components, Coast Guard, Secret Service, TSA, Border Patrol, all the ones I've, I've and plus many others. How are you going to integrate all those? It's my belief, and it's my mission to make sure that science and technology helps serve that purpose of integration. Because when you look at the broad organizational chart that I said I'm not going to put back up, if you look at that, it's going to, how do you bring all those pieces together? It's going to be through science and technology to bring them components to have a like need. And that's how, it, it's not going to be because of a political appointee. It's going to be because of the people and the mission being carried out across the actual agency itself. Working with all the components, science and technology uh, also works with the state and local r responders, and they're making a pretty tremendous impact. For example, when Hurricane Florence approached the coastline, science and technology deployed several technologies to help with the response. Although upon landfall, it registered only as a category one storm, Florence actually brought 11 foot storm sur surges and dumped 30 inches of rain. The flooding was devastating. The storm was quickly followed by Hurricane Michael. Michael was a category four storm, had wind speeds over 155 miles an hour as it slammed into Florida and brought additional rain through the Florida Panhandle, Alabama, Carolinas, and Virginia. Making the best decision for the communities in the face of such powerful storms is extremely challenging for emergency managers and search and rescue teams. That's why the science behind the solutions we provide focuses on saving lives and mitigating the impact of the storm. We provided two storm modeling and simulation tools that helped understand where the storm surges were going to go and how much they were going to rise. The accuracy of that technology means the difference between getting people to safety or being stranded and maybe even drowning. We also deployed a phone application for search and rescue teams. While not your typical phone app that we know today, the Tactical Awareness Kit allowed federal and state local jurisdictions to work together over an 18,000 mile expanse of territory. So even when the cell towers were down and they couldn't provide each other with real-time video feeds and reliable geolocations, our technology enabled them to communicate and actually rescue people. With the nonprofits and 15 federal agencies supporting that effort, there was a great need for coordination, and S&T, the science and technology, provided that coordination. As you can see, our technology is not just a science project. It ties directly to a larger mission that spans across many states, agencies, and local jurisdictions. Although we're a young department and a young directorate, uh, we do a lot of innovation for the government. We're bringing meaningful technology to the front line. 
The next example illustrates that homeland security is more often hometown security. It's personal and affects us individually. Right here in Las Vegas, you had a gunman opened up at the Mandalay Bay, killing 58 people, injuring hundreds of us, others. And this has been the deadliest shooting. And what we did is we took what we could from learning of that incident and we produced videos and training for protection of schools, homes, houses of worship, churches, mosques, synagogues. And we did that with the full knowledge that we needed to make sure that on, uh, normal citizens, everyday citizens, were going to be able to know how to react, know how to respond in a circumstance, in a, in a um, horrible, horrendous situation like that. And we keep on hearing these on the news. Understanding how incidents like active shooters affect a community, it's really part of our job and understanding how science through advance, advances in technology can change our world for the better by allowing people to be better equipped to respond to those security challenges. Other areas where we enhance hometown security relies on those communities ravages by the opioid crisis. In 2017 alone, approximately 50,000 Americans died from opioid overdoses. So at s and we want to stop drugs before they reach our communities. We're currently researching better ways to detect opioids coming through international mail system. So we're expanding our capabilities by calling on and utilizing some of the best, brightest minds across the country in an effort to expand and explore new and innovative solutions. So that means we're going beyond government. The government doesn't have all the answers. But there's a lot of folks out there that may have thought of something that we didn't. So we are able to actually hold prize competitions so that we can get beyond the government bureaucracy to find people that may have a solution and they don't know how to present and bring it forward. This spring, we launched a multi-million dollar prize competition that challenged innovators to submit novel plans for rapid, non-intrusive detection tools that would help find illicit opioids in international mail. The competition was lost and it was launched in collaboration with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, the Office of the National Drug Control Policy, and the U.S. Postal Service. In our finalist selection phase, we're looking forward to proposals that will address the national epidemic. We're also deploying advanced drone technology to reduce the amount of opioids entering our communities. We use drones at national sporting events and ever, any place that there are large, large crowds. We do it not just to survey the crowds, but we do it to survey to make sure that we protect the crowds. So it's not just boots on the ground, it's also technology in the air. Over the last decade, s and has brought many solutions directly to the communities. Because s and has had a long-standing relationship with federal, state, and local law enforcement, we have been able to provide them with many tools to help them. One of the successful tools has been Forensic Imaging Program, which began in 2010. It detects and recognizes faces for further forensic analysis and sees child sexual abuse videos. To date, this groundbreaking work has reunited over 500 children with their families. In 2012, s and and the U.S. Department of Agriculture developed a foot and mouth disease vaccine. This advancement represents <coughs> one of the largest developments in foot and mouth disease vaccines in the last 50 years. And it protects against this highly contagious disease that can decimate livestock, affect our food supply, and have cascading impacts on our economy. Taking these steps further, our scientists are training international veterinarians about the disease. About two months ago, I was up at a place called Plum Island off of Long Island, and that's where we do all the testing for the uh, foot and mouth disease. And when I was there, there were over 50 foreign veterinarians that were there to study the disease because they hadn't seen it before. And you may recall a few years ago that Great Britain had to slaughter tons of 
pounds of cattle because of the, it's very, very prominent. And another disease that that lab is working on, uh, DHS has five labs, and the, the Plum Island lab um, was originally uh, going to go over to agriculture, and there's a debate about where it's going to go, but I, I, I only share that because it is doing so much great work. It really doesn't matter which agency it works for as long as our food supply is protected, and we never th really think about it like that. But um, African swine flu, we haven't heard a lot about it, but that's something that they're working on now as well. It's not classified, it's not sensitive. We're just, they're, they're just constantly doing something to protect us well beyond what you hear in the news. And I, and I thought that was uh, interesting and important to share with you. Our technologies are also saving lives in the wake of natural disasters. Following an earthquake in Nepal in 2015, the Finding Individual for Disaster Emergency Response, we call FINDER, which by the way, for the museum, um, both here as the spy museum, uh, we're gonna wanna work with y'all if you wanna be able to bring some of this technology and put it on display here, uh, which we would really like people to see firsthand current technology. But anyway, on the finder, it saved actual, actually many, many lives. Um, using the finder, the uh, emergency teams were able to detect two heartbeats in two different collapsed structures. They allowed the rescue workers to save four people that would have otherwise died in that earthquake. Because the finder is able to detect um, human heartbeat buried beneath 30 feet of crushed materials hidden under 20 feet of solid concrete and from a distance of 100 feet. The finder technology is being used as part of a bigger exercise we're participating in last week and th this coming week with FEMA and the Central United States Earthquake Consortium. It's called Shaken Fury. And this exercise is simulating the response to a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake near Memphis, Tennessee. The operational exercises, like Shaken Fury, expose our first responders to emerging and developed technologies that would advance their ability and their skills to rescue people in all these natural disasters that we continue to experience. We have teams from Canada and Australia participating in this search and rescue exercise offers science and technology a unique opportunity to showcase the technologies that we have with our international partners. Our work with law enforcement also extends to the canine teams. s and developed a non-invasive method to read a dog's mind. Now that may sound a little far-fetched. You may want to think about the old fickle finger of fate that Senator Proxmire would give to people. <laughs> Well, that's not what this is about. We really wanted to determine how does a canine sniff out and detect certain explosives, drugs, um, and to understand that. And so we have uh, developed a, an, an analysis of how that works um, and paint a, a scent picture with the canine sensitivity. And this is gonna be critical in, in future technologies, in airports, in train stations, so that it's non-invasive, non-intrusive, but we're more accurate than just the screeners that we have now. Our technologies also continue to thwart acts of terror. Our surface transportation program looks to strengthen security in our transit systems with non-invasive approach to screening. We're looking at higher fidelity sensors such as millimeter wave systems to quickly detect threats as people move through high traffic transit systems like the subway. These sensors can be placed in walls, on platforms, columns, ceilings, and even on turnstiles. I was at one of our other labs uh, last uh, month where you just walk through like you're going through to the gate. You don't even know you're being screened, but you're being screened. It's not out there yet. But we want to do this so that we can rapidly get people to their destinations without interfering with their travel, but we also want to do it in a way that everybody's safe. 
We want to make sure the traveling public can maintain their privacy as well and their safety by using the sensors that emit low-level radio waves to detect threats in the transit system without disruption to their commute. The program is also coupled with a video forensic tool that can tag a person to a left, to a left behind item and then reconstruct the path of that individual across multiple camera views. With this tool, hours of video can be scanned much faster. If you remember the bombing at the Boston Marathon, if we had this technology, then the perpetrators would have been found much quicker. Examples demonstrate areas where we're helping with technical solutions, saving lives, addressing a variety of threats, and recognizing our role at the intersection of science and technology. We recognize that because the world and the threats are changing constantly, that we have to be effective for the future by being able to adapt to evolving threats. So one of our most important recent contributions to securing the nation is our ability to adapt to all the changes that are taking place. We're constantly looking at new ways and exploring new opportunities through universities, labs, centers of excellence, as well as the public. The way technologies develop and commercialize is also changing rapidly. So this has meant that federal R&D operations like science and technology has to co collaborate with many groups, both inside and outside the government and the private sector. We also have to reduce the bench design to deployment. We've normally been around from three years to five years. We need to put it down to one year, and that's what we're aiming for. What I'm talking about that is that from the design of the actual technology to the, the deployment, Three years is a long time. Technology changes so fast, your solution won't be a solution anymore. And there are truly endless capabilities for us to assist all of DHS operational components and ultimately the nation. Because our R&D is such a critical path to solving the problems we face, writing new policy behind the scenes, we have a network of labs, experienced program managers, scientists, and engineers looking for new ways to solve old problems and new emerging challenges. We know how important it is to harness the power of industry, small and big business, and the power of a great mind who is developing the next best thing in his or her garage. They are all part of S&T, this enormous network. This includes, as I said, our labs, our centers of excellence, and we have a tremendous power to convene great energy and expertise from the broader Homeland Security Group. s and is leading the charge to think differently about how solutions can make it to the front line and continue to adapt in a threat landscape that will most certainly continue to shift and change. I've only touched on a little bit but I didn't want you to feel like you were watching paint dry on the wall tonight. So I want to thank you for coming this evening and to listen to some of what s and is doing and what it means to be in the unique intersection of science and security. The work that s and does is vital to the nation's law enforcement agencies. Our job at DHS is to keep our nation safe and secure. We're also thrilled to find out that s and is actually saving lives every year with our technology and developed for the DHS components and state and local first responders. And we are all very grateful for all the men and women <coughs> who dedicate their lives to protecting our country today. The same way as we're grateful to all of those whose story is told at this wonderful National Atomic Testing Museum and all the men and women, some of you are here tonight, who helped win the Cold War. I hope this presentation has provided you with a sliver of a broader understanding of the work of s and And as I learned from one of our museum curators last week, if nothing else, I hope you're more interested now to go online and look up what DHS does and what does s and do and how can you help your government help you become safer and more secure in your own country.